Check one, two. Check. The book and the man. Uh, Jay, uh, the uh, dividing line of the table would be like right here. He thinks he has to play all these psychological games in order to gain an unfair advantage, not realizing that I'm the king of psychological games. Are we ready? That's for Jay. Jay understands his hands are going to be a little shaky. All right, welcome everybody to this final debate of the night. And the debate is, did, is, did Muhammad of Islam exist? So we're going to have a debate between Dr. David Wood, 
Dr. Jay Smith. It's gonna be a, pretty much the same format as you've seen before. We're gonna have opening statements of 20 minutes each. Then we're going to have 12 minute rebuttals each, and then eight minute rebuttals each, and then a one minute summary and wrap up. Five minutes. Five minute. Okay, I had a one minute. You gave it to me. <laughs> okay, I know. All right. Uh, wait, one second. Hey, uh, Sam, or where's Anthony? Could one of you guys check uh, check the uh, YouTube channel? Make sure everything's running smoothly. You'll be able to tell from the comments. They say they say if everything if they hear everything is okay and stuff. Check. So, gentlemen, I'm going to uh, do as I did on the last debate when we hit the 20 minute mark or the 12, whatever the minute mark is. I'll let you know that your time is up so we can keep the debate proceeding and moving forward. David, you can begin. Your first, do you want to, we're going to do a YouTube check first? We're good, okay. I was just looking at that uh, thing go in and out again. Hmm? It's good? Okay. All right, I guess we'll just try it. Well, good evening. I'd like to thank Ministry to Muslims for arranging this debate and the church here for hosting. I'd also like to thank Dr. J. Smith for giving me this opportunity to debunk one of the most astounding pseudo-scholarly conspiracy theories the world has ever seen. Uh, you know, when, when people hear that David Wood is debating J. Smith on an Islamic topic, lots of people think we must, we must be up to something, but we're not. We really have a significant disagreement on whether the Muhammad of Islam existed. Uh, I still believe in the overall picture of Muhammad that most Westerners who study Islam believe in. He's born around 570 AD, starts receiving revelations around 610, um, preaches for 12 years or so in Mecca, flees to Medina, um, builds an army, conquers his enemies, dies around 632, that sort of thing. So I'm what you might call a Muhammad realist. Jay, by contrast, is a Muhammad mither. I'm the only thing standing in the way of the mighty Jay Smith who's trying to convince the world that your fake prophet never existed. So when you speak of me, speak of me fondly. Now, Jay is going to present a number of problems for Muhammad realism, the view that the Muhammad of Islam actually existed. I'm familiar with many of these problems, and I acknowledge that there are some problems. There are some difficulties. We'll be discussing them. But we have to watch out for the classic move of the conspiracy theorist. The conspiracy theorist says, look, there are some difficulties with your position. Therefore, you should abandon your position and adopt this far more absurd conspiracy theory. No, no, we don't. Just because there are problems or difficulties with a position doesn't necessarily mean you should abandon the position, especially if the alternatives seem far less likely. If you're a Christian, there have probably been times when you've wondered, why the all-powerful, loving God you believe in allowed this or that to happen? Why did this child get cancer? Why did that church get hit by a tornado? But you're still a Christian. Why is that? Well, you believe that there are good reasons to be, to be a Christian that outweigh any difficulties you might face, and you believe that the alternatives have more problems and are supported by less evidence. So, why should we believe, uh, why should we be Muhammad realists in spite of the challenge from Muhammad Mithers like Jay. There are many reasons to believe that the Muhammad of Islam existed. Here in my opening statement, I'll give three. First, 
Muslim sources report a number of embarrassing facts about Muhammad that wouldn't have been invented by conspirators creating a fake prophet for their new religion. This point is grounded in what historians call the principle of embarrassment or the criterion of embarrassment. The idea here is that when people lie and invent things to support their position, they tend to invent things that help their cause, not things that hurt their cause. When someone admits something that makes his position look bad or foolish, he's probably not making it up because he wouldn't invent something that's an embarrassment to his cause. So when we examine testimony, we can ask ourselves, is this the sort of thing someone would make up? If it's not the sort of thing someone would make up, we have at least some reason to believe that the testimony is accurate. Applying this principle to the Muslim sources, if people are going to fabricate stories about Muhammad because they're inventing a new religion, they're obviously going to fabricate stories that make Muhammad look good. They're not going to fabricate stories that Muhammad, make Muhammad look stupid or insane or evil or possessed. This means that when we open the Muslim sources, if we find stories that make Muhammad look stupid or insane or evil or possessed, the best explanation for why we have these stories is that these things really happened. And if they really happened, then Muhammad obviously existed. But we have to be careful here because what's embarrassing to Muslims today in the West wasn't necessarily embarrassing to Muslims nearly 14 centuries ago in Arabia. Muslims in our time are embarrassed by all kinds of things we read in the Quran and the Sirah Maghazi and the Hadith. According to Muslim sources, Muhammad had sex with his prepubescent nine-year-old child bride Aisha. He had sex with his slave girls. He allowed his followers to rape their female captives and to have sex with prostitutes and to beat their wives into submission. Muhammad ordered Muslims to assassinate his critics and to execute apostates and to violently subjugate Jews and Christians. He supported his religion by robbing people. He had a man tortured for money. Muhammad bought, owned, sold, and traded black African slaves. All of this is embarrassing to Muslims in our time, which is why Muslim leaders usually cover up this information. But we have to remember that these facts weren't embarrassing to the Muslim community centuries ago in the Middle East. Muslims back then didn't have a problem with child marriage or beating wives into submission or raping female captives or anything else I just mentioned. So the principle of embarrassment wouldn't really apply here because if these practices were acceptable to Muslims in the early centuries of Islam, there's no reason that someone couldn't have included them in fictional stories about a prophet he was inventing. But we find other stories in the Muslim sources that are quite different. We find stories that are pretty embarrassing to all people from all times. And we find stories that we know were embarrassing even in the early stages of Islam because we find early Muslims trying to water down the stories or to explain them away or to erase them from history. Let me give you 10 examples of things that no one would invent about a prophet he's trying to convince people to believe in. One, we know from Muslim sources that when Muhammad began receiving revelations, his first impression of his revelations was that they were demonic. When Muhammad fled the cave of Hira, he was convinced that the first five verses of Surat al-Alaq had been put into his head by a poetry demon. What changed his mind? His wife and her cousin, who weren't there and had no idea what he encountered, had to persuade him that he wasn't possessed. He was a prophet of the great God Allah. Is this the sort of story that Middle Eastern rulers would invent to make their new religion more appealing somehow? I don't think it is. Two, we know that after Muhammad's experience in the cave, he became suicidal and tried to hurl himself off a cliff. Later, when he stopped receiving revelations, he again became suicidal and tried repeatedly to hurl himself off a cliff. Now, if you are manufacturing a prophet to unite a bunch of Middle Eastern tribes, do you think you'd portray him as someone who runs to a cliff to hurl himself off whenever something doesn't go his way? I certainly wouldn't. Three, according to our earliest Muslim sources, Muhammad delivered revelations from the devil. These are the infamous satanic verses. When Muhammad delivered the original version of Surah 53 to his followers, it said that 
In addition to Allah, there are three goddesses that Muslims can pray to, Alat, Alusa, and Manat. Muhammad delivered these verses to his followers. He bowed down in honor of them, and his followers bowed down with him. But a little later, the prophet of Islam came back and said that these verses, which he had delivered as part of the Quran, weren't really from God. They were from Satan. And he replaced them with the words that we find in the Quran today. Now, if you wanted to invent a prophet, would you portray him as a man who couldn't tell the difference between a revelation from God and a revelation from Satan? Of course not. For we know from multiple references in Sahih al-Bukhari and other sources that Muhammad was the victim of a magic spell that gave him delusional thoughts and false beliefs. According to the story, one of Muhammad's enemies stole his hairbrush and used it to cast a spell on him. The spell lasted somewhere between six months and two years. Now tell me, if you were inventing a prophet to suit your fancy, would you say that his enemies could temporarily overpower him with black magic? Not a chance. Five, Surah 4, verse 3 of the Quran says that Muslims can marry up to four women. But the Muslim sources tell us that Muhammad had a lot more than four wives. Uh, Tabari says that Muhammad consummated marriages with 13 women. We know from references in Bukhari that Muhammad had at least nine wives at one time. So why did Muhammad get more? Well, he received another revelation, Surah 3350, which gave him and him only special moral privileges, namely lots of extra wives. Needless to say, if I were inventing a prophet, I wouldn't invent stories that show him violating his own revelations. Six, Muhammad once had an adopted son named Zayd, who was called Zayd bin Muhammad, Zayd's son of Muhammad. One day, Muhammad saw Zayd's wife practically naked and began lusting after her. When Zayd found out that his adopted father and prophet was lusting after his wife, he divorced her so that his adopted father slash prophet could have her. Then Muhammad married the divorced wife of his own adopted son after causing the divorce by lusting after her. Allah himself had a difficult time justifying this marriage, so we can only wonder why someone would invent the story. Seven, according to Muslim sources, Muhammad had a pretty disturbing problem. He was frequently covered in semen. His child bride Aisha reports in numerous hadiths that she would try to scrape it off or wash it off before he headed to the mosque, but even after she thought she had gotten it all off, she would suddenly see more. For the life of me, I can't imagine anyone inventing a religion and then making up stories about the new prophet being covered in semen. Eight, according to Muslim sources, Muhammad would suck on the tongues and lips of little boys and have the little boys suck on his tongue. He also guaranteed that if he sucked on a little boy's tongue or lips, that little boy's tongue or lips would never be tormented by hellfire. Now, if you were inventing a prophet to be the center of your new religion, how many stories about your prophet sucking on little boy's tongues and lips to protect them from hellfire would you include? The answer is zero, and yet Islam has a bunch. Nine, Muhammad made prophecies that were already falsified by the time he was supposedly being invented by conspirators. In Sahih al-Bukhari, Muhammad prophesied that one of the signs of the end times would be that the buttocks of the women who worship the idol Dul Khalasa would shake while walking around the shrine. But the idol and the shrine were soon destroyed by Muslims, so the prophecy can no longer be fulfilled. Muhammad once pointed to a boy and said that before the boy became an old man, the judgment would come. That boy has been dead a long time, so the prophecy failed. Now, if Muhammad was being invented long after his supposed death, why would the conspirators invent prophecies which had already been falsified and which therefore exposed their new prophet as a false prophet? 10, according to the Quran, Allah rescued Jesus from those who wanted to kill him. So obviously, if we're inventing a prophet for Islam, we're going to invent a similarly miraculous story for our new prophet, right? But how did Muhammad die in the Muslim sources? 
He was poisoned by a Jewish woman whose family had been slaughtered by Muslims. The poison ate away at Muhammad's internal organs, but it took him about three years to finally die in total agony. If Middle Eastern rulers were fabricating their new prophet, why would they make up a story about their prophet being outwitted by a Jewish woman and then dying like a sick dog? Why do we have an endless array of stories in Islam's most trusted sources that make Muhammad sound stupid and insane and evil and possessed? If you were inventing a religion, would you make the central figure of your new religion sound stupid and insane and evil and possessed? There's only one way these stories could have gained momentum in the early Muslim community. They were true. And if they were true, then Muhammad existed. Second, if conspirators were fabricating a new prophet for their new religion long after Muhammad supposedly died, they could have invented any number of stories about his rise to power and conquest of Arabia. They could have said that Muhammad appeared in Mecca with great signs and wonders and angels and convinced the population that he's a prophet and then went from town to town and everyone converting. They could have said whatever they wanted. But when we piece together the earliest and most reliable information about Muhammad, we find a man who couldn't perform miracles, a man who was ridiculed for plagiarizing his revelations, a man who was viewed by the vast majority of people as a moron or a madman. How would a man like that rise to power and conquer Arabia? Easy. Deception, manipulation, bribery, and violence. That's exactly how Muhammad rises to power and conquers Arabia, according to the earliest strata of Islamic history, before the story started being massively embellished. Muhammad told the Meccans that they should accept him as a prophet because of his amazing poetry and because he's mentioned in the Bible. They thought his poetry was a joke and they didn't know about the Bible, so most of them weren't impressed and Muhammad didn't win very many followers that way. And Muhammad went to Medina. In Medina, Muhammad's message became, if you join my religion and fight for me, we'll go out, we'll kill the men, we'll take their stuff, we'll take their wives and their daughters as our sex slaves, and if you die while fighting for me, Allah will take you to paradise and give you an eternity of deflowering virgins. And that's when men started converting in droves. Once Muhammad became the most powerful force in Arabia, the pagans had to convert or die Jews and Christians had to convert or become dhimmis or die, and anyone who left Islam or made fun of Muhammad had to be executed. This is the only way an illiterate 7th century Arabian caravan robber with Muhammad's mental and moral and spiritual problems could have been accepted as God's last and greatest prophet, and it's exactly what we find in the Muslim sources. But again, if later rulers were simply inventing the story of Muhammad as the foundation of their new religion, they could have said anything. There was no need at all for a fabricated Muhammad to rely on deception, manipulation, bribery, or violence to convince people to believe in him. Third, in 1999, the American psychologist Paul Witz published a book titled Faith of the Fatherless. It's about the connection between early childhood experiences and later religious belief. His research showed that the overwhelming majority of prominent advocates of atheism over the past few centuries either had no father figure when they were young or they had a terrible relationship with a bad father figure. The overwhelming majority of prominent advocates of theism, by contrast, had a close relationship with a father figure they loved and respected when they were children. Near the end of the book, Dr. Witz responds to a possible objection to his analysis. Since there have always been bad fathers or missing fathers, why is popular atheism such a recent development? He replies by suggesting that in the past, when atheism wasn't a live option for people, the psychology of the defective father would have been expressed differently. This brings us back to Muhammad, whose father died before he was born. Then he was sent to live with some Bedouins in the desert. They became convinced that he was demon-possessed, sent him back to live with his mother when he was four. Then his mother died when he was six. He was sent to live with his grandfather, and his grandfather died by the time he was eight. So Muhammad lost every relationship with a mother figure or father figure that he had by the time he was eight. Why is this important? Well, according to a lot of research, someone with this level of childhood loss and trauma will express this loss and trauma as an adult in three main ways. One, he'll have a tendency to rebel against authority and tradition. Two, he'll have trouble forming stable, 
healthy relationships with other people. And three, he'll have a problem with father figures and especially with viewing God as a heavenly father. If you've studied the life of Muhammad, you know that Muhammad exhibited all of these features in extreme fashion. Muhammad is the extreme example of someone who exhibits these features. Muhammad doesn't just rebel against authority and tradition. He turns against his own people, against his own tribe, and against his own city, violently subjugates them, smashes their idols in front of them. Muhammad doesn't just have trouble forming stable, healthy relationships. All of his relationships were massively twisted. Muhammad's first marriage was to a woman named Khadija, who was 15 years older than him, the same age his mother would have been if she hadn't died. Muhammad would run to her when he was scared, even though he was a grown man. He had his best friend hand over his prepubescent daughter for marriage. He um, took the wife of, of his own adopted son. He married a woman after torturing and killing her husband. These were not normal relationships. And finally, Muhammad doesn't just have a problem with father figures. He abolishes adoption in Islam. There's no more adoption in Islam. Muhammad abolished it and unadopted his adopted son. And no one in history had a bigger problem with viewing God as a heavenly father than Muhammad. The Quran says that the highest relationship anyone can have with Allah is a slave to master relationship, and that the heavens and earth are on the verge of being torn apart whenever someone says that Allah is a father. This leads to an obvious question. How much did Jay's merry band of conspirators know about psychology? If you guessed absolutely nothing, you're absolutely correct. And yet, if we want to accept Jay's conspiracy theory, we have to believe that they were the greatest masters of psychology ever because they wrote a fictional account of Muhammad's childhood that lines up perfectly with his psychological profile as an adult. More problems to come. Thank, thank you, David. All right, Jay, as soon as you're ready, you'll have your 20 minute response, uh, 20 minute opening statement. Great, okay. Well, I wish I could go right into the rebuttal, but we're gonna have to do this first. So let's go right into it and let's, um, let's show you what and who this Muhammad is of the 7th century versus the Muhammad of the 9th and 10th century. So now David has given a very convincing view of this Muhammad of the 9th and 10th century. What he didn't want to talk to you about is this timeline. Take a look at the timeline, you'll see the problem. Everything that he referred to, all those stories that he talked about, the 10 different problems, do not take place or are not written down, are not at all, uh, uh, you might say, even uh, put to uh, any historical evidence that we can see at the time, even the century that he lived. Take a look and see where the names are. And there, there's the story of Muhammad born 570, he went through that. And now let's see where all that takes place. Take a look at this slide here. The material that he talks about, everything that he's dependent on for his paradigm does not come until Ibn Hisham. You notice I have an Ibn Ishaq up there, but I've kind of put him in a very shadowed form. The reason why is I don't think any of the thing, I mean the material that we use today on Muhammad comes from Ibn Ishaq. We don't know anything about Ibn Ishaq. We're, it's only attributed to Ibn Ishaq. Everything we know comes from Ibn Hisham. Look at his dates. He doesn't even begin to appear until the ninth century. Muhammad died in 632. I'm getting an echo here. Is that, is that important or not? Can you, can you still hear me all right? Okay. So here you have Ibn Hisham, 833 is when he first, that first biography of Muhammad is written down. That's 200 years after the fact. Al-Waqidi comes after that. When is the first traditions on concerning his speech? That doesn't come until Al-Buhari. Look at the dates, 870, Sahib Muslim, Tirmidhi, Ibn Majah, Ibn Dawud, and Nisa. That's all up until 915, going into the 10th century. And we have nothing about the Tafsir or the Tahik until Al Tabi 923. So we're looking at two to 300 years later, this is all written down. Regardless of whether it's disturbing or embarrassing, we'll get to that in the rebuttal. Just look at the timeline. And notice where all these writers are from. They're all from those red dots. But everything that he has been talking about take place in the green dots. You notice that? Can you see the north-south problem here? 
everything about this Muhammad from the 9th century is supposedly taking place in Mecca and Medina, in the Hejaz, the central part of Arabia. All the writing about him, everything that's written about him, takes place in Cairo, Baghdad, Tabaristan, Basra, and Bukhara. Hundreds of miles away and hundreds of years different. Therefore, none of the traditional writers lived or worked in Mecca or Medina. They were too far to the north of Mecca and came from the west and east of Baghdad. You can look at the uh, you can look at the kilometers. I won't get into that. By the way, all of these slides, if you want them, I can give them to you. Not for those of you who are watching, those of you who are here who bought tickets, okay? You can have all my slides. So you can show these to your Muslim friend. This problem of northern hegemony is not at all understood well. Remember, you have, look at the bottom, you can see where Ibn Hisham is. Ibn Hisham died 833. Notice that he is, again, 200 years after the fact. Look how far away all of his materials, all of these northern areas are where the Abbasids originated from. I'm going to come back to this a little later. You need to understand that almost everything we know about Muhammad comes from the Abbasids, not from the Umayyad area. Have you heard this before? This is probably new to you. Furthermore, all of it was written in the 9th and 10th century. They all wrote their material hundreds of miles too far away and hundreds of years too late. We get to the Quran, and I want to just look and say a quick about this. I'm not going to talk much about this because we're going to get into that tomorrow. But when you look at the Quran, you have five different canonizations of the Quran. Only one of them is from the Hijaz, and it's the one we don't know anything about. And that's the canonization of Uthman. Shadi Nasr, who is a Harvard professor, has written his book. He just came out last week with the second canonization uh, by Ibn Mujahid. All of the recitations, or you might say all of the qira'at that, that we've been going through this last year, since June 8th, since that infamous uh, interview that they had on YouTube. Take a look at all the canonizations. Ibn Mujahid is the one that puts together the first seven readings. Look and see where he is. Uh, look and see his dates. 936, that's 10th century. Al-Shatabi is the one that puts together the next 14 students. These are the riot. Those all are introduced in 1194. That's the 12th century. Al-Jazari is the one that brings in the next nine. So you get seven plus 14, that's 21, plus nine equals 30. The 30 riwayats and the readers all are finally introduced in 1429. That is 15th century. And take a look and see how many years that is after Muhammad. That's 800 years after Muhammad, we get the 30 Qurans. And finally, they have to put it back to one in 1924, the 1924 Quran. But I want you to look at this map here. I'm sorry, not this map, this timeline here. Of all those 30 rewats and the readers, there they all listed up there. The three, the green ones are the seven, the red are the three, and the purple are all the, the riwayats, which would be the students that come from every one of them introduced by Ibn Mujahid, al-Shatabi, and al-Jazari. They all are introduced 800 years, but take a look and see where, they're, where they all are introduced. Three of them come from Mecca, five from Kirats. That means only eight of them, of the 30, come from the Hijaz that he's talking about, the area that this is all supposed to be taking place. When you look at the others, one comes from Cairo, three come from Damascus, six come from Basra, and 12 come from Kufa. And the, the Quran that we have in our hand today, it is from Kufa. It is not from the southern part. It is all in the north. Look at the red dots. Here's the north-south divide again. Let's look at the Quranic Arabic. Even the Quranic Arabic, the Arabic that we have in the Quran, is not from that green area. The green area is what he's talking about. That's the 9th and 10th century Muhammad, all right? If this guy received the Quran in that area then the Quran that's in our hand today is not that Quran because that Quran has the Tar Marbuta in it. The Quran that we have in our hand today has the Aleph Maksura in it, has the Aleph in it, has also the Irab. These are what we know as unstressed inflectional short final vowels. None of this exists in any Arabic that existed in the seventh century in that part of the world. So what are you talking about, David? Where is this Quran that you're talking about or this man that received it that far south? If he had come, come from a man named Muhammad who lived in the 7th century in that part of Arabia, he would have had Sabaic Arabic. Sabaic Arabic, ironically speaking, the Sabaic Arabic that actually was in, introduced in Yemen does have the five dots and has the three vowels, the very thing the Quran needed. And if they had, he had written it in that Arabic, we would have not had any kidats. I hope you're getting this, folks, and I hope those who are watching are getting this. Now, what about... 
this Muhammad who received letters. And this is something the Muslims love. They come to me all the time. What about this letter? Let's look at this letter right here. This is the Ashtanami. If you look at this letter, this letter has nothing to do with Muhammad. We now know it's fraudulent. It is dated supposedly to 625. There are 47 writings listed in Saad's account in 845. He doesn't name the Ashtanami once. Look at the minaret on the right side. The minarets were only introduced in the ninth century, not used until the 11th century. Look at the name Sultan is referred to, but there was no reference to Sultan that early. That was only introduced 350 years later in 998. Mosques were mentioned, yet there was no mosque in Egypt until 641. And as far as the Malak Makura, the angel of proximity, that is a Sufi writing that was introduced in the 10th century, about 340 years later. What's more, when you look at that, you will see it is actually a writing from the 16th century. The earliest and the original we have is from the 16th century, which makes sense because that's the right time to have written a letter like that. Wrong man, wrong place, wrong letter. The Constitution of Medina that Muslims always like to say proved that Muhammad had existed. First of all, take a look and read the Constitution of Medina and tell me what Jew would have assigned that Constitution of Medina. No Jew would have. Though it's pro-Jewish, there is no Jewish records of it. There's no archaeological evidence of any Jews living that far south, not that early, not in the seventh century. And so you can see where and when did this really get uh, put together. We don't know of any reference of this until Ibn Hisham writes it in 833. So the first reference we have of this is 200 years after the fact. Therefore, the historians, people like Hoyland and Andrews, consider it a fraud because there was no Jews that far south, and the only source for it comes in the ninth century Muslim traditions. Again, much, much too late. The Doctrine of Iacobi, probably one of the most famous documents. This is the one that Muslims are always throwing at me. And David, I don't know if you realize this one, but when you look at this, you can see this, first of all, doesn't talk about Muhammad. It talks about a Saracen prophet who comes with a sword and has the keys of paradise. Does that sound like Muhammad to you, any of you? When you look and see what it says, you can see that according to this doctrine, this um, uh, uh, Yacobi, which was supposedly written around 634, shows and assumes that he's still alive in 634. That controverts the traditions. That he has the keys to paradise. No, this prophet fits more a Judeo-Christian monotheistic background. And he has the keys to paradise is also referring to Matthew chapter 16. What's interesting, because it's written in Arabic, Aramaic, not in Arabic. What in the world would this be referring to a guy who doesn't speak any Aramaic. I don't remember Muhammad ever speaking Aramaic. Conclusion, there is no reference to the name Muhammad on this document, no reference to this prophet being a Muslim or belonging to the religion Islam or any reference to the city of Mecca, nor of his book, the Quran. He could be almost anybody. of Islam, according to what David's telling me, that would have been controlled by the time of Mu'awiyah. And that's, I understand it, I would agree. Mu'awiyah is historical. And so therefore, from Tripoli all the way over to Afghanistan, that would have been under its control, which is an enormous amount of land. So therefore, somewhere amongst all that area, that's the brown and the orange, there should be some reference to Muhammad somewhere, right? One reference to Muhammad and I would be satisfied. By the time of 680, we're talking about 50 years after Muhammad. Where is David able to show me one reference to this man named Muhammad that he's talking about? In that area, that swath of land from Afghanistan to Tripoli, let's start with the Quran. Well, okay, let's look at the Quran. Four references to Muhammad in the Quran. In chapter 3, verse 144, in chapter 33, verse 40, in chapter 47, verse 2, in chapter 48, verse 29. Take a look and see what the Muhammad is. The Muhammad there, really, the name Muhammad means the blessed one. If you look and you understand that, Murad, who is a scholar in both Arabic, he's on our team, He's the one that's working for us from the Middle East. He has been saying, he's watching right now, he has been saying, look at the, look at the Arabic there. It's from Nabataean Aramaic. Did I not say that earlier, that this is Nabataean Aramaic Arabic? And when you look at that, it just talks about the Blessed One is no more than a messenger. In every case, when you look at those four references, this could be Abdul Malik himself, referring to himself, not to a man named Muhammad. Let's take a look at the Dome of the Rock, because that was also constructed by Abdul Malik. Look at the inscriptions, the only original part of the buildings. 
There is reference I don't have time to go into, but almost every time when you look at the Shahada there, you can see that this is referring to a messianic figure, and it's more likely than not, it is confronting the Byzantine Christianity that is there in Jerusalem. That's why it's built there. That's why it's built looking up and down onto this, uh, the Church of the Sepulchre. It's a one-upmanship by Abdul Malik, who's way up in Damascus. I don't have time to unpack that, but what I really want to go to are probably the most substantial authority that we're looking at today, and that is the coins. Let's look at the coins, because the coins that are coming out, and this is all stuff that has come out this year, in 2020. Look at that swath of land and look and see what they now control. Anytime you have a new emperor, if you are a new caliph like Abu Bakr, Umar, or Uthman, or Ali, the first thing any caliph or any king or any leader does is to mint coins. And they put their image on the coins. And they put their name on the coins. And they explain who they are. And they always say what the religion is, and they always say where the mint is. Look at the coins. This is evidence from the 7th century. Now look and see where they're minted. They're minted in two areas, one in Syria, the other in Iran. None of them are in the Hejaz. Too far north again. Are you, am I getting kind of boring, saying the thing over, same thing over again? Everything we see happening in the 7th century comes from the north, not from the south, not from Mecca, not from Medina. When you look at the coins, you can follow a sequence on the coins. This would take me an hour to go through all the sequence. What we do know, start on the left. Those are Arab coins. It's not that they weren't minting coins. They were minting coins. Look what's on the coins. These leaders, these Arab leaders, had crosses in their hands. They had crosses above their heads. Why would you be wearing a cross if you were a Muslim? No reference to Muhammad in any of these. No reference to Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, or Ali. When you get to Mu'awiyah, finally Mu'awiyah in 661, he would be the first caliph from the Umayyad Caliphate. Take a look at his coins in the West. The coins in the West are gold solidices and they're copper coins. He himself has a, cough, a cross on his head and he's holding a cross in his hand. He's a Muslim? No reference to any people called Muslims, no reference to any religion called Islam, no reference to any man named Muhammad, no reference to any book called the Quran, and no reference to any city called Mecca. It is just blank on all these coins. Now, the coins are great because they are from the 7th century. They do not disintegrate. They do not deteriorate. We can look at them today, and we have not been looking at them until this year. Boy, I could go a whole time on coins, because if you want to see what is the first Muslim coin, you've got to start with 692. That golden coin you see there, that's Abdul Malik. He is the first one to introduce Muhammad. He is the first one to introduce Shahada. And then he puts his own image on the coin in 693 because Justinian II goes to war with him because he dares to do something that's different than the Byzantines want, proving that the influence is coming from Christianity in the West. But look what's on the backside of all the coins coming out of Iran. Look at Mu'awiyah's coin, all the way up from 661 up to 680. On the backside of the silver coins in the East, are Zoroastrian fire altars. Nothing to do with Muhammad. Take a look and you'll see. Who is the man we're looking at? Now, I'm just going to introduce him today. I don't have the time because I say I only have five minutes. I've really got to zip through this because I'm only halfway through my slides. Iyas ibn Kabisa of Tayyaye. This is the Muhammad of the 7th century. Iyas ibn Kabisa of Tayyaye. He comes from Hira. He comes from the Lakh. He's a Lakhmic king. He was a king. He was not poor. When you look and see what we know about him, we now know that he was there in 618. He was the one that joined with the Arabs when Heraclius came and destroyed the Sassanians. 622 this happens. That's why the year 622 is so important. And he is the one that is credited with that, with then helping with the relationship. I don't have time to go and tell you about Yes, That's for another time. But we're now looking at him. We're finding that this is the Muhammad of the 7th century. He's nothing like the Muhammad of the 9th century. A completely different man. He is a Christian to begin with. He was a Christian Muhammad. His name is Iyas ibn Kabisa. His nickname was Muhammad, and that was his name to get. Now, hold on to that. I don't have time to go into this. We'll come back to him. I've already said we can't find anything about the rightly guided caliphs. But now let's look at the rock inscriptions. The rock inscriptions are almost as good as the coins. We have found 30,000 rock inscriptions. And here's what's interesting. When you look at the rock inscriptions, you will see that none of them prior, before, before we get onto that, take a look and see where the rock inscriptions are. They're all up there in the north. They should be down in the bottom part where the Sabaic script is. All of these not rock inscriptions from the 7th century up until 690 are all using Nabataean Aramaic, which is from Petra. Ooh, tu, 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 tu. Petra. Have I said that one before? 
And when you look and unpack those rock inscription, Ilka Linsta, oh, you've got to give me more minutes than that. Ilka Linsta, 100 dated rock inscription. Everything we see before 690, none of it referring to anything that we, that we need to be looking. There's nothing there about Mahabad on any of these rock inscriptions. They're still for, there for us today. And then we get to the inscription of 741, the Apocalypse of Pseudomethodius, Kintanyuato, Byzantia, Arabica. That's a mouthful. Remember when Patricia Kurura looked at this and said, this is the first reference we have for Mecca. We don't have any other reference for Mecca. What she didn't read is the rest of the inscription, because the rest of the inscription explains who and where this place was. And it places it way up in southern Turkey. The first Mecca is way up in southern Turkey. I don't have time to get into that. Wait till you see when we come back. I, want, I don't want to get into to Petra. Petra is amazing. This will take me another hour. And I just want you to look at this. Look at this map here. Notice everything we know about Petra from Jordan. Take a look and see. Notice where all the trade routes are. Not one of them goes south. They're all going east and west and north. Why is it that nothing is going south if that's where Muhammad was, if that's where Islam began, if that's where civilization began for the Muslims? I don't want to get into this reference here. Let's just go and look at this conclusions. Notice. All the manuscripts, six to, to nine of the earliest manuscripts. This is not the Kiras. We're talking about the earliest manuscripts. That's the top copy of the Samarkand, the Ma'il. All of these great six major manuscripts that we've been talking about for years now, since 2014. Look and see where they come from. They come up from those cities up in the north, not from the south. The Kiras, 22 of the 30 Kiras come from the north, not from the south. The Hafs Quran that we use today comes from the north, not from the south. The Quranic Arabic that we look at you today comes to the north, not from the south. The Qiblas until 727, all the Qiblas up until 727, we don't have any Qiblas from Mecca or from the south at all. They are all from the north. Look at all the Muhammad himself, Ilyas ibn Kabisa. He comes from the north, not from the south. The Iraq inscriptions, all of them come from the north not from the south. The year 622 comes from the north, not from the south. The first Mecca comes from the north. I see that. You don't have to keep it up there. And then the conclusions. Here we go. I'm going to do it all in one minute. The sources for everything we know about traditional Islam that David would like to support come too late and too far away, except for the first canonization, which is impossible to find. The other four canons are too far north. The Quranic Arabic, again, is too far north. The Ashtanami letter is, again, too late. The Constitution Medina, much too late. The Dr. Yacobi is, again, the wrong time. Muhammad is not in the Quran, nor is he on the scripts of the Dome of the Rock. The coins all support a 7th century archaeological and documentary evidence and simultaneously confront the traditional 9th to 10th century uh, narrative that David would like to push forward. Ias Kabisa is the man I think we're looking for. He is, and I'm going to introduce him as the 7th century Muhammad. I would love you to tell you the story about why he is so great. We can't find any of the four rightly guided caliphs in the 7th century. The rock inscriptions say nothing about Muhammad or Mecca or Islam or the Quran or the Muslims until after 690. They only begin to start showing a religion that, as we know it, from 720 to 730. We're going to talk about the 741 inscription of the first Mecca. That is in southern Turkey, much too far north, and everything we know about Petra, the initial sanctuary of the Arabs, which was later replaced by the current Mecca. Therefore, the conclusion. The historical record suggests that most everything we now know of Islam in the 7th century is either too far north or too far away or much too late to be the Islam of the 9th century Islamic traditions. Islam is really an Abbasid creation. Thank you, Dr. Smith. We are now going to go. That concludes our opening statements. We're going to go to our first phase of rebuttal, which are each participant is going to have 12 minutes. Don't you just love conspiracy theorists? They always make it sound good, don't they? You could sit there and listen to a, uh, you know, a 9-11 truther, a moon landing hoaxer uh, all day long. They could speak to you for 40 hours on their awesome, awesome, awesome understanding of the details there. They love to point out problems with the position they're tearing down so they can get other people to buy into their conspiracy theory. But they don't bother to tell you about the holes in the narrative. Now, Jay offered a number of problems for... Muhammad realism. And I find that part of the problem here is that we just have wildly different expectations for what to expect from the evidence that we're examining uh, in the uh, you know, early history of Islam. So he says, we don't have any early sources. Where are all the sources? Where are all the first century of Islam 
sources that talk about all of this stuff? Well, I think Jay already alluded to the solution there. He mentioned that there, there was a writing of Ibn Ishaq, but we don't even have that, right? So in our earliest biography is more than a century after the time of Muhammad. We don't have that. We have a later ascension, a watered down version from Ibn Hisham. Why does Ibn Hisham say that he uh, did some editing and deleting? He said there was too much embarrassing material from that first century, right? I mean, not, not from, from the Ibn Ishaq version. Well, what, what's Ibn Ishaq doing, supposedly? He, Ibn Ishaq is supposedly going to earlier earlier authorities and giving the information they presented about Muhammad. Well, if this information is embarrassing already by the time you get to Ibn Hisham, what do you think they're going to what do you think they're going to be doing with any early evidence that they might have? Keep in mind, this is a group that is famous for burning books that they don't agree with, right? We know that already, right? Hey, these these Qurans don't agree with each other, burn them all. What do you think they're going to do once they start finding out that there's all this embarrassing information about Muhammad. But there's, a, there's, there's another problem that we, we actually know of historically. By the time you get to the rise of the Hadith scholars, so people like Bukhari and Muslim, these guys very rapidly convinced the Muslim community that they were the only reliable way, they had the only reliable way of doing history, the Islamic way. And so before that, you had the Sira Maghazi guys, right? They're writing biographical uh, stories about Muhammad, they're writing uh, stories of Muhammad's war campaigns. The Hadith guys come along and they say, you can't do it that way. You have to do it our way. So anything, anything from early Islam did not meet the criteria of these later guys. And so do you guys know how books worked back then before the printing press? If you wanted a book to last, you needed people copying that thing by hand. So, for instance, we have, we have about a fifth of the works of Aristotle, about a fifth. And he had a community that was passing on his knowledge, and most of it didn't last. You need a very, very dedicated group of people passing on your knowledge if you want it to last. So, the point here is, when I look back there and I say, oh my goodness, there are no sources from the first century of Islam. Oh, you mean by two centuries after that time, they viewed that material as very unreliable and using an un-Islamic method, and therefore no one's copying it, and therefore we don't have it? Shocker. That's my view. So in other words, I'm not surprised by that. It seems to fit together with what we know. But let me give you, let me give you an example of why I think there was reliable information coming out of the first century. Let's take the example of the Satanic verses, which I mentioned earlier. I mentioned the Satanic verses. When Muhammad received revelations from the devil, delivered them, and then came back and said, the devil, the devil made me do it, tricked me. I have 50 Muslim sources on the satanic verses. 50. Those stories, they come with little, little isnads and so on that tell you where those actually came from. A bunch of those go back to some supposed first century witness. right? So some of them go back to Ibn Abbas. Some of them go back to students of Ibn Abbas, but not from Ibn Abbas himself. And so notice you have 50 sources on the satanic verses going back to lots of different people in the first century of Islam. Now, Jay just looks, but I don't have the actual text. I don't have the actual book. Well, okay, what's the alternative here, right? Well, so you don't have the book, therefore the story doesn't go back there. Well, what's the problem if you say the story doesn't go back there? And this is what I mean by when someone gives you a conspiracy theory alternative, you need to investigate that and say, does this really make sense? So one, as I pointed out, the satanic versus story was massively embarrassing. How do we know? Because we can trace the stories of when they came and they keep watering it down more and more. At first, it's Muhammad who receives the revelations and delivered them. Then at a later stage, it was no, Satan imitated Muhammad's voice so that people thought Muhammad said it, but he actually didn't. And then later on, they water it down even more to where you don't even know why the pagans are bowing down in honor of this surah. They, they, they completely get to the point where they completely delete the story. And so they're clearly embarrassed by it. They're clearly embarrassed by this story. But think about this. If we want to say it didn't happen because we don't have the actual text, it didn't happen. Well, what you have to say then is, one, someone invented this story. 
So in the century after Muhammad, apparently, someone invents the story of Muhammad, the new prophet they're telling everyone to believe in, invent this story. And not only are we going to invent the story, we're going to invent dozens of sources for it that go back to this previous century. So keep in mind what the conspiracy here is, right? You're not just inventing Muhammad, the prophet. You're inventing the entire ensemble cast, right? You're inventing all the wives, all his followers. All those are invented according to this theory. And not only are you inventing them, you're inventing their children, their grandchildren, all the way down to the people that Jay is going to be talking about when we actually get to people that, that Jay would agree existed. So all of that entire history is invented. So they don't just invent the story of the satanic verses or something. They start inventing dozens of narrations that go back to all these people who did not exist. Again, if this was all a conspiracy, this is the most brilliant conspiracy theory I've ever seen, right? Because this is what people would be looking for. So they would have had to known it back then. Hey, don't just say Muhammad delivered revelations from the devil. Invent dozens of sources saying it so that people will really know our prophet couldn't tell the difference between a revelation from God and a revelation from Satan. This is just too much. Your conspiracy is doing too much work here. Right? Now, um, Jay pointed out, you know, if the Quran had come from Muhammad, it, it would have been different. It would be different from the Quran that we, uh, that we have now. Uh, look, there's no disputing between us that the Quran is one big giant mess and that the history of the Quran is one big giant mess, right? But that's consistent with Muhammad actually receiving revelations, delivering them to his followers, and then a big mess happening afterwards, which would be my picture. So I don't think um, that really supports either case. Uh, he says the letters don't work. No dispute there. Didn't use them. Constitution of Medina didn't work. Uh, no dispute. Didn't use it. Uh, Doctrine Yacobi doesn't work. No problem. Mm, <laughs> not disputing that. Um, he says that Mu Muawiyah existed. But where are the references to Muhammad? Here again, we come to an issue where I think we're expecting massively different uh, details to come out from this first century of Islam. If you read the Muslim sources, if Islam had been like 1% more violent, the community would have wiped itself out. They started slaughtering each other almost immediately. Aisha, the mother of the faithful, marched an army against Ali, the commander of the faithful. People who were companions of Muhammad at the Battle of Badr and Uhud and so on were slaughtering each other over a disagreement. And that just kept happening and happening and happening. If you look at what happens until you start getting uh, political power massively consolidated, these guys are spending all their time slaughtering each other and then going out and slaughtering other people. They're not building monuments. They're not doing that. Eventually, they get to a place of stability and that's when you start getting the monuments. So again, I don't know what you'd expect to be looking for. I don't, I don't know what you, what you think these people in a desert slaughtering each other are going to be producing as far as you know, inscriptions and so on. Um, Jay points out that the evidence tends to come from the north, not from Mecca. Uh, again, that wouldn't be surprising as Islam expanded. That's where you start getting to areas where there's more civilization, there's encounters with the Byzantines and so on. So that's where you'd expect a lot more of this to come from. Uh, he says, coins and crosses, um, coins with uh, Muslims and crosses. But yeah, that wouldn't, fit out, that wouldn't fit well together with Islam today. But I think people massively overestimate how orthodox Islam was back then. If you look, you have all of these different groups all vying for power, and they're all killing each other, and they're all expanding into various areas of, there's, there's, there just doesn't seem to be enough time to sit down and develop really orthodox theology. And that's why all these different groups, all these different sects of Islam spring up and start slaughtering each other. So um, it wouldn't surprise me that people who are encountering the Byzantines and see Byzantine crosses and don't really have much of an understanding of why that would be such a problem in Islam um, wouldn't have a problem with that sort of thing. Um, now, keep in mind, I said in my opening statement, there are problems, right? You can, you can look at that and say, I don't know, that's not, I still don't get it. Why, why would they have a, a, you know, a, a cross? You can say, well, you know, they're, they're trying to interact with other people, and so they don't have a problem with the cross. So you can say that, you can say, well, that, maybe that's a stretch. Well, I agree. There, 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 are, there are tons of things we have to look at. And go, I don't know. Doesn't, sound, doesn't seem like it makes a whole lot of sense there. It's the alternative that I have a problem with, right? 
If you say, hey, I don't get why that guy would have a cross, and you move from there to, aha, it was a Christian original, and he later became Muhammad, and there's a massive conspiracy, then I got a problem, right? Because the solution to the problem seems massively more absurd than anything you're trying to explain. Um, Jay says that Mecca, I mean, that, that Petra was the original Mecca. Here again, you know, what's the evidence for this? You have some, now notice here, because this is a good example. So, some mosques, old mosques, face Petra, apparently, not Mecca. Now, Jay is familiar with the work of Dr. David King, who has been for decades the world's leading authority on Qiblas. And he argued before anyone ever heard of Dan Gibson that the early mosques were facing unexpected directions. But he came up with explanations for that sort of thing, right? He said that these are, they were focused on astronomical alignments and so on, rather than just what we think of facing, pointing your mosque in the direction of Mecca. So he points that out. Now, Jay will obviously say he's been refuted. Dan Gibson is right. The world's leading authority on these kidlas is doesn't know what he's talking about. But here's the point. You've got a scholar who says one thing. You've got Dan Gibson who goes out and he says something else. If you want to say, hey, there's a problem here, fine. Say there's a problem and then go through possible solutions. Maybe the early Muslim community pointed those there for some reason. We don't know why. Once you start saying, no, that was the original Mecca, and that was the original this, and that was the original that, and all, everything is a conspiracy here, you've gone vastly beyond, you've gone vastly beyond any problems in what you're trying to explain. So, um, again, because this always happens, right? Oh, you know, look at the moon landing. That flag doesn't look like it would in space. Well, therefore, NASA hoax, right? No, you've you got to take these problems, take a close look, and we're going to do that a little bit more as this debate goes on. Thank you. And Dr. Smith, you'll have your 12 minutes as soon as you're ready to begin. Well, David, I'm a little disappointed. You went back to principle of embarrassment. You did the same thing you did eight years ago. In fact, I already had every one of your points on my paper. This is from the debate you had with Robert Spencer in 2012. You haven't changed in eight years. I just sat there and said, oh, he said there's demon possession, use of black magic, suicide, nine to 15 wives, poisoned by a Jewish, Zainab and Zayn. You just went right down the paper. You've got to move with the times. You saw what Robert did. He destroyed you in 2012 with those 12 points. Do you want me to remind you or do you want to sit through it again? Take a look on what he said. In fact, I'm just going to jump it together. Remember what he said about demon possession. Remember what he said about US, a black magic. Remember what he said about the suicide. In every case, Muhammad survived and actually went above it. This is exactly what you do. Whenever you have a prophet, he always is confronted with a problem, and he survives the problem and is victorious. So he survived the demon possession. He survived the black magic. He survived the casting of spells. He survived and came out victorious against the suicide. Why didn't you do the whole story? That is typical of any time you're trying to aggrandize your prophet. What about the 9 to 15 wives? Well, you may not want 9 to 15 wives, but most there are men's, men, uh, men in the 7th and 9th, sorry, the 9th century. Let's look at the 7th century. In the 9th century, that would show that he's virile. And that's why it's important that any, anybody who is a leader of men, because of the responsibilities of that leader, and Muslims have said this many times, and I understand it, they had to show alliances through these wives. More than that, more than that. What about being poisoned by a Jewish? Remember, that's typical demonization of the Jews. You will see that right through the traditions in the Quran. There's nothing new about demonizing the Jews. Zainab and Zaid, and this is a good one. This one, you'll have to unpack it a little bit more. And Robert Spencer does a really good job of showing that this whole, this whole story had to do with the eradication of adoption. Muhammad could not have any son because he is the last, the seal of the prophet. Therefore, you have to eradicate that adoption. And that's why Surah 33 is introduced so that he could shut down that idea that there was anybody that comes after him because he must be the last, the seal of the prophet. It also simultaneously attacks Jesus' adoption. That's the son of God. So you can see it's a double whammy. That would make sense in the ninth century, not in the seventh century. The satanic verses, and here I'm going to end. This one is probably the best one because remember what I said. Up until 749 when the Abbasids come to power, 
and 749, everything was Umayyad. What is it that the Umayyads hated? They hated the Umayyads. The Umayyads were Nabataean. They were Arab. The Abbasids are Persian. They're Sassanian. They were destroyed by the Arabs. Remember that. And that's why the Arabs, where did the Arabs and where did all the Umayyads have their headquarters? In Damascus, way up north. Where did the Sassanians have their headquarters? In Baghdad, which was called Stesiphon at that time. When they finally came to power, that now explains why all the mosques are facing Petra, because the Umayyad, the Nabataean sanctuary, was always Petra. That's why all the mosques were facing Petra. You talk about king, I can't believe, I think you were doing that tongue-in-cheek, because I hope you don't think that king, Dr. King, here's a man that's the world authority on mosques and qiblas, the direction of every mosque, and only went to one in his entire career. Dan Gibson, in a period of 25 years, went to over 100, physically went to these mosques. And he not only physically went, he looked and found where every one of the Qiblas went. And whereas Dan King, using 9th, 10th, and 11th century, the very material you're using on the Qibla, remember, none of the 9th, 10th, and 11th understood why the Qiblas were on every direction. In fact, they thought they were in thousands of directions. No, they weren't. Dr. Dan Gibson found that they were only in four directions. And every one of those four directions had to do with the politics that was happening in 660 with Mu'awiyah, that was happening in 690 with Abdul Malik. I'm sorry, 695 to 705 with Abdul Malik. If you follow the Qiblas, you can follow the political. If you follow the politics, you can follow the Qiblas, which is exactly what you're supposed to do as a historian. And for heaven's sakes, go to the mosque and find out where they're directed if you're the world authority on it. Shame on Dr. King. He never left his libraries. That's why you need to do the same thing, David. Stop looking at 9th and 10th and 11th and try to understand what's happening earlier. You need to go back to the 7th century. Now, David, have you noticed he did not really go back to the 7th century to, to, to rebut anything I said today? Did you notice that? He just told us the conspiracy, conspiracy. Oh, this is not conspiracy. This is historical evidence. Everything that I've been pointing to, and I want to give credit to a group of men who have been doing this for 20 years. Mel from Sneakers Corner. Murad from the Middle East. Joe, I can't tell you where he's from. He doesn't want me to tell you where he's from. These three guys are amazing. And I hope you're all listening because you need to look at what they're doing. Go to Sneakers Corner and see what they're coming up with. They are way ahead of everybody else because they refuse to trust anymore the 9th and 10th century. I've refused to trust the 9th and 10th century. It's too far and too far north. Too late, too far north. If you want to find out what happened in the 7th century, why not go back to the 7th century and look at the art of material that we're getting there. Look at the coins. Look at the inscriptions. David, you didn't deal with the inscriptions. You talked about the coins, and you kind of snuffed it off as to say, well, they're not that important. No, they're very important. Remember, back when anybody came to power, what's the first thing you do? They didn't have radio. They didn't have television. They didn't have internet. How did they announce themselves? They used coins. Everybody used coins because that was in the hands of everybody. And the first thing you did as any leader, a new leader, is you put your name on the coin. Those coins exist. They were putting their names on it. These are not a conspiracy theory. We're talking about hard evidence. Look at the names on those coins. Look in what they do. What next they think they do, they also put a denomination of what they're worth, and then they put always a religious icon to show what religion they belong to. And that's why all the coins in the West the gold solidices were all Christians, all the ones in the East were all Zoroastrian. Nothing Muslim about them. What do you do then? Then you also write, you chisel away on all these rocks, thousands, tens of thousands of these rock inscriptions. David, you didn't deal with that. I want you to start dating with the 7th century. Stop all this conspiracy theory. Stop talking about things you talked about eight years ago and come back into what you're going to refer to today. Because if you're going to talk about principle of embarrassment, then I'm going to put throwback at you. Why is it that if you're going to use that category, why don't you use it on Christianity? If you want to find out about Jesus Christ, let's use his criteria. We must use that which comes two to three hundred years later that is embarrassing about Jesus Christ. Why don't you start with the infancy gospel of Thomas? Look at the infancy gospel of Thomas written in the second century. There is a Jesus that you would love to follow. This is a Jesus who a 
he presents as a naughty, irresistible child, vindictive child, who uses his miraculous powers to take revenge on teachers, neighbors, and other children, some of whom he blinds, others he cripples, and he even kills. Is that the Jesus you want to take? Because that's the Jesus of the traditions, the Gnostic traditions that come 200 years later. Now, why were they not chosen by Arrhenius and the early church fathers? First of all, because they're too late. And secondly, that is not the historical Jesus we have from the first century. So, David, if you're going to use the idea of taking that which is later and more embarrassing for your criteria, then I want you to use, start using the infancy gospel of Thomas to now define your Jesus. Thank God that's not my Jesus. And I would say to the Muslims who are listening, everything you're dependent upon is based on nothing more than happenstance. Talk about imposition of this conspiracy theory. I want you also to look at back and look and see what, why, you, why is it you want to go to Ibn Ishaq? The reason why I said that Ibn Ishaq, I put him in a shaded form, is because look and see who Ibn Ishaq is. He is the first one of the Abbasids, who's still a carryover from the Umayyads, who writes the first biography in 765. The Umayyads have come to power in 749. So roughly 16 years later, he writes the first biography. That biography is riddled with Umayyad material. And there are all kinds of stories about that Muhammad, because remember, that Muhammad starts to appear on the inscription, the rock inscriptions. I'm using hard evidence again. This is not supposition. This is not conspiracy. The rock inscriptions start to show this Muhammad from 720 up into the 730s. Ibn Ishaq writes that story, but that's not the narrative that the Abbasids like. So 70 years later, Ibn Hisham is commissioned to take what he liked of Ibn Ishaq and throw the rest away. Which means we don't have Ibn Ishaq anymore today. That's why I put him shade in him, because there's an evolution between Ibn Ishaq and Ibn Isham. And by the time you get Ibn Isham there, that story is now the narrative that the Abbasids want. But they still don't have the sayings. The sayings still need to be put together. The sayings take another 40 years to be put together, and that's not till the late 9th century. But those sayings, remember, Al-Buhari is given, according to the traditions, according to the story, he's given 600,000 of these sayings, and he's to whittle them down and destroy that which did not exist. Now, how would Al-Buhari know what Muhammad said if he's living 240 years later? According to David, he's a lot more trustworthy because he is living 240 years later. He whittles them down and only retains 7,397. That means he throws out 98% of it, only retains 2%. 2%. Every tradition, the nine volumes we have on al-Buhari is only 2% of what was there. What do you think he threw away? He threw away everything the Umayyads had. And that's why I keep on saying Islam is an Abbasid invention. It is a Persian invention. It is an invention that was created and maintained in Baghdad. And that's why everything that comes before it had to be eradicated. Yes, you talk about the burnings. Look about the burnings of the cross. I mean, take a look and see about all these stories. They are probably half true. There probably was a burning of Qurans, but it did not happen in 652. And that's why we can't find any Quran from 652. Have you noticed? We can't find any Qurans from the 7th century at all. Put it all together and you'll see what's going on. This is a political machinations between two different groups that hated each other's guts. And finally, as the Umayyads start to reduce power and they start to get weaker and weaker, these others who are waiting to see where are they going to put their kiblas, they're going to wait to see who is going to win. And finally, when they finally, the Abbasids finally come to power in 749, they zoop, all the kiblas go towards Mecca. But what about that Mecca? That Mecca never existed. We can't find any reference to that Mecca, not until the 8th century. And the interesting thing, when you look at the five stages that are there in that Mecca, those same five stages can be found in Petra, and they fit exactly what the traditions say later on, but not the dimensions that we see in Mecca today. That's why I say, the Muhammad you're looking for is nothing more than an Abbasid construct. But I've got a list here, and later on, I want to go and show you what exactly we have now found about the Muhammad they should have used, the Muhammad they should have chosen from the 7th century. I'll have to do that in the next one, because I see I now, I'm out of, now out of time. Thank you, Dr. Smith. We're going to move to our last stage of rebuttals before we go to closing remarks. This rebuttal stage will be eight minutes each. Check, check. All right, in my opening statement, I made three points. First, there's so much embarrassing material in the Muslim sources that we just can't, con can't conclude people 
were inventing it when they were starting their new religion. Um, Jay apparently isn't a fan of the principle of embarrassment, which is one of the most valuable, one of the most valuable principles that we could ever use when examining uh, testimony from the past. So I pointed out de demonic possession, suicide attempts, the satanic verses, black magic, hypocrisy, taking uh, Muhammad taking his adopted son's wife, Muhammad walking around covered in semen, uh, tongue sucking, false prophecies, poisoning. Jay responded to a couple of those. Uh, second, I argued that the only way someone as horrible as Muhammad could have become known as God's last and greatest, uh, greatest prophet would be through a combination of deception, manipulation, bribery, and violence. That's exactly what we have in the Muslim sources. There's no reason to say any of that if you're just making up a figure. And third, the stories that we have um, about Muhammad's childhood in Islam's uh, earliest sources are exactly what we would expect given his massive rebellion against authority and tradition, his problems forming healthy relationships and his hostility against father figures, and especially with his hostility against God as a father figure. In other words, someone got the childhood right to produce uh, that sort of expression of this childhood trauma. And this isn't coming from David Wood. You can, you can, uh, you can go check out Paul Vitz's book. Uh, so Jay's responses to some of this, uh, Muhammad survived demonic possession and suicide and satanic verses uh, and, and, and black magic and so on. So he made it through this. So there's no problem here. Yet, yes, there is. Your guy could be taken out with black magic. Your guy thought he was demon possessed. You have a suicidal guy. And Jay says, well, but it's okay because he made it through that. Are you serious? So someone said, you know what? I want to show that the prophet is really resilient. So I'm going to make a story about him repeatedly trying to kill himself whenever something goes wrong. And I'm going to make a story about a guy getting hair from his hairbrush and giving him all sorts of delusional sexual uh, thoughts and so on. That, that's what the story actually says. So that's why they invented this story. Now, seriously, are you, are you kidding me? We want to show that the prophet is resilient and, and we invent these stories about him being controlled by black magic and so on. Very, very strange stuff. Um, Jay says, well, nine to, uh, nine to 15 wives would just show that Muhammad is virile. I agree. That wasn't the problem. We're not talking about how many uh, women Muhammad could have sex with. We're talking about Muhammad violating his own revelations, right? You get the command to do four. If, if, if you want Muhammad to have nine to 15 or whatever, just, just make that the rule, right? You don't need to show Muhammad constantly coming up with revelations that allow him to violate his previous revelations so that his wife Aisha said, my, your Lord hastens to satisfy your desires which would also be very embarrassing in the Muslim sources. It's Aisha making fun of Muhammad for always getting anything he wants. Why invent that in, as a commentary on Muhammad always getting everything he wants? Doesn't sound like something someone would invent. Um, as far as being poisoned by a Jewish woman, uh, this is, uh, Jay says, well, no problem, this is demonizing Jews. It, the, the, the Jewish part is not the relevant part there. It's that Muhammad was completely outwitted and swallowed poison and was outsmarted and spent three years in total agony until he was dragged around with his feet dangling behind him um, like Weekend at Bernie's. And Aisha, Aisha said, and of everything Aisha had seen in her life, she said she never saw anyone go through more than Muhammad did. And then he died, again, like a dog, like a sick dog. You're inventing your religion. And according to Jay, it's supposed to be this rival to Christianity. Why is Jesus in the Quran superior to Muhammad in any way if they're, putting, if they're putting this forward as the religion that's meant to respond to the Byzantines? Why not have your guy do something more miraculous than be born of a virgin and perform all the miracles that Muhammad performed and then a more miraculous ending? You can write anything you want. You're making it up as you go along. Oh, yes, you're Jesus. He rose from the dead. Or even according to Islam, he, he was rescued by Allah. Muhammad died like a dog. But it's to, it's to demonize the Jews. If you're just going to say something, you can say that about anything, right? Say about any, any, uh, any story like that, you can just say, even true things. You can always say, well, it was because of this. It, does, it just doesn't fit. Come on. It doesn't fit. These are not, if you're making up a religion to unite the Arab tribes, this is not the sort of stuff you'd be putting in there. You're basically giving ammunition to everyone that you are trying to persuade. You're giving them ammunition against you. Um, Jay says that the story of Zayd and, and Zainab was meant to shut down adoption so that Muhammad wouldn't have a descendant. Well, why'd you write him as having an adopted son then? We need to do away with Muhammad having an adopted son. You just made it up. Why would you need to do away with it? 
Do you see the problem? According to Jay, the reason they're doing these things is to cover up this other thing that they made up. It's the same thing with the story of like the satanic verses and so on. They keep trying to change and water down the story in order to deal with the embarrassment of the original problem. But you guys invented that. That's the problem, right? Why would you do that? Now, um, we had a lot of other issues in there. Again, why are they inventing prophecies that had already been falsified by the time they're supposedly being invented? In other words, if you're later, a later Arab ruler, you're looking at dual, 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 dual Kalisa. It's already been destroyed. Why are you going to use that as a sign of the end times, the people worshiping there? They weren't worshiping there in, anymore. Why are you inventing false prophecies that could never be fulfilled? Again, was it, if Jay wants to argue that they invented this so that we could later refute it, that's fine. But if you're, invent, if you're saying they invented it to be a believable religion, you got some problems here. Um, now, Jay repeatedly says, this isn't a conspiracy, it's evidence. Well, no, Jay, this is the definition of a conspiracy theory, right? You, you said Islam was an Abbasid invention. You're saying all of this was invented, right? You're saying they, they, they moved the Kaaba from one place to another. They invented a prophet. They convinced the entire generation. This is the definition of, it's a massive conspiracy. Think, during the time of someone like Abdul Malik, who's supposedly inventing this, don't, once he starts spreading these stories, don't all these people know that none of this happened? I mean, unless they were brand new, don't they know, hey, what, we haven't been serving Muhammad. What? We haven't been facing that direction. What? Where'd this new religion coming from? So somehow they're all involved in this conspiracy, and then they start cranking out tons and tons of sources where they're supposedly getting this information from the previous century, and it's all a hoax. Well, there's a problem. Suppose, Abdul Malik, suppose one of the later rulers starts inventing these things, well, guess what? You have multiple groups back then. You have the Karajites. You have the Shias. You have rival Sunni groups. They're fighting these groups. If you say, ha, we, we've got our place, we've got our place in Petra, now we're going to move it down here. We're going to move it down here to this place called Mecca. We're going to invent this. We're going to invent this new guy. One, I don't know what you guys are fighting about to begin with, because now it doesn't make sense. I mean, were there any Shias? This, this is the party of Ali in this dis disagreement of, you know, the, the leadership after Muhammad died. So were these people around? If not, you're fighting over something else. Now, when one group comes along and says, we just changed our city to here, and we just changed this to that, why in the name of common sense would these other groups that you're fighting with say, you know what, we'll adopt the exact same story? Why would all of your enemies adopt the same story? This, there, there's some holes in the narrative, Jay. Thank you, David. Your eight-minute rebuttal as soon as you're ready, Dr. Smith. Okay. How many times did he say invented? 24 times. Did I ever say that they invented it? Once? What did I say, David? Are you listening to me? They didn't invent a thing. That already existed. Remember, you already had from 661 up until 749, almost 100 years of stories that were being created. Started, many of them, by Mu'awiyah, continued by Abd al-Malik, all the way up through the Sufyani period, up to the Marwanid period, and included in the Mumayyad. These stories had to be sublimated. None of them were being invented by the Abbasids. I never said the Abbasids invented a thing. In fact, many of the stories had to be sublimated and changed. And that's why when you look and see what exactly what the Abbasids have done, they have taken what was given them. They didn't invent it. And they had to quickly change the narratives, change the narratives, so that it could fit their narrative. That's why no one's inventing a thing. Please get it right. You're wasting your time because you haven't yet answered my question. What about the 7th century? You haven't said a thing about the 7th century tonight. Have you noticed? He spent his entire time talking about embar the embarrassing principle, the principle of embarrassment. That's embarrassing, folks. If that's all you've got is the principle of embarrassment, because you don't like it, David, because you're looking with your Christian eyes, and I understand. And this is, you've made a whole industry of it. This has been your whole ministry. Because as you as a Christian, he is embarrassing. Of course, Muhammad's embarrassing. 
Those traditions are absolutely embarrassing. But you're, la- you're talking as a 21st century Christian. No, you're not. Actually, you're talking as a biblical Christian. When you compare the Muhammad of the 9th century, who is very Arab, yes, he is very much from his, his environment, and you compare him with Jesus Christ, there's no comparison. He is full of embarrassment. Now, I can understand why you want to hold on to him. I can understand why you want to continue with him. Because your whole ministry has been based on basically destroying that Muhammad. Please continue to do that. Don't stop, David. Sam, don't stop. We need that Muhammad destroyed because that is the Muhammad of almost 2 billion Muslims today. That's the only Muhammad they know. That's the Muhammad I want nothing to do with. He is embarrassing. Understandably, David, he is embarrassing. But I'm a historian, and I have to understand the historical record. And the historical record is showing me that there is no Muhammad at all. There was a man named Iyas ibn Kabisa. And I just want to show you what we now know between... Oh, I got the wrong paper. You can see what we now know about Ibn Kabisa compared to your Muhammad. We know that Ilyas Ibn... Ilyas Ibn... I, I don't like you sitting there. I wish you'd just go out. It's no fun being told how much time I have. I'm used to waffling on without any care for time. But let's go ahead. Ilyas Ibn Kabisa on this side. He was of noble... On this side, he was of noble birth. Muhammad... He was humble to begin with. Ibn Kabisa, let's just call him Iyas. Iyas was a king with power given to him. Muhammad was poor and had to gain power over others. Iyas never used violence to attain his position. Muhammad, once in power, always used violence to retain it. Iyas was possibly a Christian who loved the biblical Jesus, whereas Muhammad of the ninth century was likely a pagan who hated the biblical Jesus. Iyas was used by others to bring about peace. Muhammad was used to do it, but... He was supposed to do it, but turned to violence instead. Yes, is historical with evidence to prove it. We knew, we know where he was born in Hira. We knew where he grew up there in Kufa. We knew that he, after 622, once he had helped to get the Arabs to create their identity, he then was deposed and he moved over to Petra in the West. Muhammad, no history at all. You have not shown me one historical evidence for Muhammad in the 7th century. David, I'm waiting for that. In your, in your final, I hope in your final summation, you will give me one short and one piece of evidence prior to 690 that refers to him by name. The man who was a Muslim living in Mecca who received a Quran. Help me here. Yes, however, is a model for everyone today and every day. Your Muhammad is not a model for anyone anywhere at any time. There's nothing embarrassing at all about Yes enormous many things uh, uh, that are embarrassing of Muhammad. And that's why you and Sam have spent a whole career confronting him. Please continue to do so. Eos was a competent guide and instructor. Muhammad was illiterate and used violence to get obedience. Eos had a death penalty, but only for those who broke the law, whereas Muhammad, he had a death penalty for those who mocked him. Eos spoke about love. Muhammad preached hate. Eos finally conquered Israel. Muhammad never came close to Israel. Eos married a Jew a Jewish woman, and had alliance with the Jews. Muhammad married a Jewish and then killed her former husband. Yes, teached, focused on Israel, whereas Muhammad focused, had nothing to do with Israel. Yes, preached about the coming Messiah, whereas Muhammad preached about himself as the last prophet. Yes, said that he had the keys of paradise, Christian motif. Muhammad, he never even mentioned it, didn't even know anything about it. Now, for Muslims listening, isn't it interesting, the Muhammad of the 7th century possibly understood by those in the 7th century, was lost by the 8th century. The Muhammad that was created out of all the stories coming out of the 7th and 8th century that was finally became the Muhammad of Islam, that Muhammad is absolutely embarrassing. And on that, both David and I are agreed. But that is not the Muhammad of the 7th century. I want nothing to do with that Muhammad because not only is he embarrassing, I want the Muhammad who, we, who they've lost. What happened to Iyas ibn Kabisa? And why did they give him up? And what was it about that Iyas that the Abbasids never retained? 
Until David can prove to me and show me that there was this Muhammad, this Muhammad that he keeps on talking about, showing us all the rabid things. And I think he knows he's, he's getting a great killing on tonight, tonight's show because all the Muslims are going to be even more infuriated by him, though he say he's arguing for them. No, folks, Muslims, he's not arguing for you. Because that Muhammad, you want nothing to do with. Why don't you come back to the real Muhammad who was there in the 7th century? Take a look and see what he was and what we're missing today. Because that Muhammad, fascinating enough, was a Christian. He loved Jesus Christ. He wanted an awful lot to do with Jesus Christ. But somehow everything that he stood for got erased. And it got erased because of the not only the Abbasid need, their narrative, that narrative had to destroy him because he was not one of them. So I give you the Muhammad of the 7th century, and I'll leave you with the Muhammad of the 9th century. Now, gentlemen, we move to the final stage. You have five minutes for your closing statement. All right, well, we have two theories before us. First, the Muhammad of Islam existed. I argued that I can't imagine anyone inventing the stories about this guy that Muslims have attributed to their prophet. If you were inventing stories and saying, hey, I want the world to believe in this, this is the prophet that's going to unite us. Again, the demonic possession and suicide attempts and so on. They made him the most obvious false prophet in all of history. They made him the most obvious false prophet in history. They literally made stories about which showed him to be a false prophet by the time they're, they're writing these things down. Can't imagine that. And I pointed out that, that history, uh, the history we have of Muhammad, according to the Muslim sources, that lines up with that is the only way a guy like that could have risen to power. And the childhood, again, the... <laughs> Someone with those childhood experiences who loses every close relationship for the first eight years of his life, we know what that produces, and it's exactly, it's exactly what we find in the life of Muhammad. So there's too much coincidence here if this is just pieced together from a bunch of strange sources. Um, I do rely on the principle of embarrassment. Uh, Jay had, I did want to respond to one thing Jay said. Jay said, why don't we use the principle of embarrassment with Jesus? Look at the Gnostic source. They have all this weird stuff. Yeah, I already mentioned that in my opening. Set. That was not weird to the Gnostics. I said, there's stuff that's embarrassing to Muslims today that wasn't embarrassing to Muslims back then. If it was embarrassing to people back then, yeah, I agree. You can't use it. But we have all of these things that we know were embarrassing because they immediately start trying to cover them up and water them down. You can look at a bunch of different sources for the same event, and you can look where these stories supposedly originate on the timeline when they're being reported, and you see a study process of watering them down. Well, one, what's the purpose of inventing them? And two, how can you actually form a timeline that goes all the way back into the 7th century of when these things are supposed to be uh, being revealed, and it all fits together perfectly? He says, give a reference before 690. Again, we have, we have some very different methods. I'm looking at that community and what I would expect from them. All they do is slaughter each other and slaughter other people. And the only text they would have written would have been laughed at by the later Hadith scholars who said their method was garbage. So I don't know what you're, I don't know what you're expecting. It, it reminds me, it's like uh, Eusebius said that Constantine commissioned the writing of 50 copies of the Bible. Where, where are they? They've all been covered up. It's a conspiracy. They're covering up because they changed the Bible. What are you talking about? Some people have suggested Sinaiticus or, or Vaticanus may have been uh, a part of this. There's no evidence for it. So best case scenario, you lost 48. What? What happened to those? They were, all, they were all covered up. It's a conspiracy. What, show me one of those Constantine Bibles or admit that it's been changed. Come on. Right? Um, so, now, uh, now this is very interesting. The, the, the second theory is that Muhammad, the Muhammad of Islam didn't exist. And Jay just said, I'm not saying they invented it. No one's inventing a thing. You said in your presentation right before that, Islam is an Abbasid invention. And reg if you don't believe Muhammad existed... Yeah, you can piece together some things from other, if you want to say it actually referred to this person, that person. But the overall history of Muhammad had to be invented. If you believe that they were, they were moving their, their center of worship from Petra to Mecca and so on, if you believe they're imposing this. And then if you believe that Ibn, As, Ibn Asak is uh, part of a conspiracy to put out this entire history of Muhammad, 
He, 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 he can't think that's true. So there have to be people here putting this together who know this stuff isn't true when you're talking about this happened and that happened in Mecca and so on. So there has to be a massive, massive conspiracy here. Once again, whatever group is doing the conspiring to invent this thing and to move things around, why are the other groups that you're at war with going along with it? Why do they buy, buy into all of the same stories? They should be saying, you see, these guys are liars, but they don't. They all go along with the same story. Interesting. All right, and that's my real problem with Jay's conspiracy theory. Jay's theory requires me to believe that the conspirators who created Islam were simultaneously the biggest bunch of morons the world has ever seen because they invented the most obvious false prophet in history and simultaneously the greatest geniuses of all time because they pulled it off in spectacular fashion to where we don't even know until Jason comes along and then we know. They pulled it off. How could they do it? And so, um, yeah, I'm going to say a conspiracy theory is not the way to go here. If there are problems with the Islamic narrative of Muhammad, fine. If you, have to, if you say we have to look into this, fine. But once you start going this massive conspiracy route and moving things around and inventing a new religion, I'd say you got problems. Um, so I'll just close out to the Muslims who are watching, because Jay mentioned them. You see me defending the existence of your prophet against the conspiracy theories of Jay. What else can I say but you're welcome. <laughs> Thank you. And our last closing statement of the night. As soon as you're ready, Dr. Smith, you can begin your five minute statement. I thought it was fascinating. <clears throat> you notice he said, you want to talk about the biblical Jesus and you want to talk about the, the embarrassing stories of Jesus. They were not embarrassing to the Gnostics. Did you pick that up? Exactly. They were not embarrassing to the Gnostics who came later. Just as these embarrassing stories that he goes on and on about were not embarrassing to the Abbasids. Tit for tat. What I'm going to do to end off, I'm going to do a little poem. I've written a poem. I did this for Hatun. Hatun knows what I'm talking about. She asked me to come on a few weeks or two on her site. And she asked me, could you put this into a nutshell, what you're talking about? So I put it into a kind of a verse. You can do this to supercalifragilistic. I'm not going to sing it because you don't want to hear me sing. So here we go. Do it to supercalifragilistic. We all know well Muhammad's name. He's been around a while. He lived in Mecca, so we're told. His prophethood's on file. Yet no one saw him face to face, nor heard him speak a word. And all we know is centuries old, and that's downright absurd. Hisham, who wrote his story down, lived two centuries too late. Bukhari, who wrote what he said, lived at a later date. There was just nothing written down they borrowed from hearsay and lived in towns way far to north, hundreds of miles away. And so it seems it's all made up by Abbasids, we're told, who sought to purge all previous views and introduce their mold, not invent, purge. They needed an identity different from those of before. They had no book, they had no man, they needed something more. Muhammad was the name they chose, and Mecca was his town. Uh, the Quran was his special book, each word and letter sound. Yet that which they say came from God was written down by men who lived in Iraq far to north, not even from his ken. The final version they call Hafs was not one of the best. He lied and cheated all the time, more worse than all the rest. The Arabic which he contained was hij from Hijaz, it was thought, its grammar, letters, just weren't right, especially without dots. So where did it originate? Where could it have come from? Or where could it have come forth? Southern Levant is where it hails, again, too far, to north. The mosque became their focal point. The Qiblas were confused. When Gibson found they pointed north, he, he was indeed bemused. Yet what about Muhammad's name? It's, again, nowhere be found. The Hijaz is the place he walked, yet nothing on the ground. The rock inscriptions are all blank. You'd think they say much more. Of him we cannot find a trace. He's really just folklore. The coins are equally opaque. Of him there's not a peep. Perhaps they went on holiday or maybe fell asleep. His town, Mecca, where he grew up and where he saw his fate, was not known until 741, 100 years too late. Many have said he wrote letters and sent them all around. The Ashtanami is one case, but it has proved a fraud. 
the Medinan constitution supposedly is true, but it makes too many mistakes. Its truths are all too few. The doctrina Jacobi is also claimed as true, but their man in Jerusalem turns out to be a Jew. Muhammad did not really live. His story is a lie. No one can find him anywhere, no matter how they try. Without Muhammad, Islam dies. It flits and floats away. Since we now know he didn't exist, Islam has had its day. David believes he did exist. He really has no choice. Without him, he's just incomplete. Yet gives David a voice. If the traditions were correct and Muhammad was a man, then I would be the first in line to give David my hand. But you and I know very well he never lived on earth. His story is just fairy tales. It really has no worth. We know David depends on him. He must stay a prophet. Who else offers him so much fun and makes him so much profit? <laughs> a man who's so embarrassing, so full of evil deeds, could never be made up. Er, he's everything Dave needs. Thank you. Well, thank you, panel members. This concludes our debate. Thank you again. And I'll turn it over to Pastor George. Uh, what, 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 wait, wait, wait. What, yeah, what, one, one thing. What did he go over? We need you to take one more minute. I think you need it. A no, comment, no, no. A comment no. about this now. I was, we, got, we, got a, we got a rapper back here. I uh, wanted to see if Veda wants to rap Jay's poem. <laughs> I'll give you a beat. I'll give you a beat, son. I don't know if you can rap it. But... You got this? We do not know if this is going to work. Go to that and go to that. Okay. So you want me to rap this poem? You want me to, you want me to, you want me to give you a beat? Hold on. I'll, I'll let you know in 12 seconds. You, 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 you can try, like, a couple bars and see if it works because I don't know if it'll. I'm concerned about Jay's flow, is what I'm saying. All right. What? Give me a beat, David. Huh? Give me a beat. All right, you ready? Uh. Not embarrassing, y'all. We all know well Muhammad's name, he's been around a while. He lived in Mecca, so we're told his prophecies on foul. Yet no one saw him face to face, nor heard him speak a word. And all I know is that is centuries old, and that is downright absurd. Here's him, you wrote his story down. Lived two centuries too late. Book already wrote it down. Said that he lived a later date. There was just nothing written down they brought hearsay. And now here is living town 100 miles away. And so it seems it's all made up. Uh, I'm made up. I'm gonna keep going. Say he's made up, and that is what we're told. We're sought to your previous views and introduce the mold. They needed an identity different from those before. They had no book. They needed something more. Muhammad was the name that they chose. Mecca was his town. The Quran was a special book. Each word would letter sound. Yet they said that it came from God. It was written down by men who lived in Iraq far to north, not even from his kin. The final version that they call has not one of the best. He lied and cheated all the time from the rest. Er <laughs> we gonna catch the beat. I'm gonna keep on going and I'm gonna catch the beat. All right, Arabic, which we contain from hinges, and that is what he thought. And I know it don't sound like it rhymes, but he didn't do it right, especially with our dots. So where did it originate? Where did it come from? Southern living was as hills to the north. The mosque became their local point. <laughs> Hold on. I'm trying. I tried. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Dr. David. Thank you, Dr. Jay. Uh, it's awesome. Uh, you guys get to choose which position you want to take. But uh, we all agree, both of them agrees that we want to see Muslims coming to know Jesus as the Lord and Savior. They do need to leave that Muhammad, that uh, if it was an imaginary Muhammad or is, was existed Muhammad, 
They need to leave that Muhammad because he is not giving them any guarantee to be in heaven. But the Jesus of the Bible, the, uh, our, our man, the man of the book, the man, our man, Jesus, he can guarantee them heaven. They can guarantee to be in eternity with him. Uh, our, all our desire here to see Muslims to follow Jesus. And that's what we need to be praying for. Amen. Uh, let's give them another hand. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No hugs, guys? Okay. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, tomorrow we're going to be here at 2.30, but in the morning, if you are, if you uh, go to the uh, ministrytomuslims.com, tomorrow morning, each one of these men here, and also Anthony Rogers speaking in different churches, uh, Calvary Chapel Norco, uh, Jay Smith, myself, who will be there at Calvary Chapel Norco if you would like to come. Uh, I believe they have two services or only one? Two services, uh, 8.30 and 10.30. Yeah. Uh, in ministry to Muslims.com, go to our strong tower. You're going to see the schedule there. Uh, in Hesperia, California, Sovereign Way Church, uh, Anthony Rogers will be speaking there at 10 in the morning. And, uh, and uh, uh, there's a church locally in, uh, I believe in Brea. Is Danny here? Uh, where David Wood will be speaking, but each one of them, you can watch them online live. If you want to, you are not able to go to that church, you can just choose one of them and watch uh, service. If you are out of state, if you are locally here, I encourage you to go to your home church. Uh, also, some of us are going to be coming here for church service. If you would like to come here, that's an option as well. But 2.30, exactly, we're going to start the schedule tomorrow. Uh, don't miss it. We have uh, former Muslims from Somalia going to be sharing their, their stories. It's going to be really awesome uh, panel discussions and uh, great, great topics. Um, I, how many of you enjoyed today, guys? It's awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Let's stand up and close in prayer. And remember, tomorrow is a Sunday. They're going to have this place for church service. If you can help us to make sure no cups, no, no trash, anything. Let's pick up stuff and make it reasonable for tomorrow for church. If you can help us, please. Thank you. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much. Lord, we thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for today. Lord, I do want to pray for Shabir Ali, Lord Jesus. I pray for the salvation of this man, Lord. I pray that you may reveal yourself to him, Lord Jesus. We do, Lord. Love that guy, Lord Jesus. We want to see him coming to know. And we know, Lord, that you love him so much as well. Lord, I pray that you may reveal yourself to him, Lord Jesus, in dreams and vision, leading him out of Islam, bringing him to know you as a Lord 